for Britain is 75 years ago this year, but that's not actually why I picked the, the, the talk. Uh, mostly what you hear about is the uh, gallantry of the, uh, the young men who, who fought in it, and there's no question that that's true. The Battle of Britain has a, a military significance as well, but there's a hidden story in the technology of this which uh, had Britain not managed to keep up. Um, uh, would have been quite embarrassing uh, when it came to dealing with the, um, with the Germans. One problem with the Battle of Britain is nobody can tell you when it started and nobody can tell you when it ended. There's no clear distinction. By the time it actually came about, which is um, late September, September, is, it, it, you can go back as early as June 1940, but the time it was actually being fought, both sides were in fact prisoners of their own history. Things had happened in the history of Britain and the history of Germany which um, brought all this about. They're, they weren't completely free agents, if you like. Um, they're, they're say that what, what had happened to the countries before and what their intentions were played a major part. Uh, basically, the, the, the Battle of Britain in many ways goes back to the First World War. Britain was bombed in the First World War. There was a Zeppelin raid on London, uh, on Lopper, I think you'll find. Yeah. Um, and Germany wasn't, because we had no Zeppelins to bomb them back. Don't, don't, don't think this was a gentlemanly act at all. You could have bombed anybody if you could. So that's the first thing. <coughs> Britain was bombed and Germany wasn't. The second one is who won the Battle of Britain? Everybody will tell you that, of course, Britain won the Battle of Britain. <coughs> uh, it's not actually strictly true. Um, basically, what we did was we stopped the Germans winning, uh, which isn't quite the same as winning yourself. Uh, it's a sort of a halfway house and not an unreasonable place to be. And under the circumstances, it was quite a significant achievement. So let's go back to the First World War when Britain was bombed. Here's a Zeppelin, shown remarkably low. The Zeppelins actually flew quite high. They were lighter than air balloon uh, craft. And they flew too high to be shot down by the fighters at that time. We'll come, we'll come to why, but aircraft in the First World War were limited to just a few thousand feet high. These things flew much higher than that, so they were completely invulnerable, even though they were huge. And it wasn't until they started getting aeroplanes and taking every single part off them that wasn't needed, picking the lightest pilot they could, putting enough fuel in there just to get up to altitude and not come home, and then up to the firing machine guns, firing tracer bullets, that they managed to shoot one down. And the pilot involved, I think, got the VC for doing this. Uh, he probably deserved it as well. And then there's this ludicrous poster which I picked at the time. It is far better to face the bullets than be killed at home by a bomb. Now, statistically, your chances of being killed at home by a bomb was immeasurably small. You stood more chance of being run down by a horse. And the idea that you would put out a poster like this, you know, join the army at once and help stop an air raid, God save the king! Yeah, well, it's all really rather... <coughs> Anyway, uh, after we managed to shoot down a few Zeppelins, they couldn't actually go that much higher, the Germans introduced uh, Goethe bombers. These are biplane uh, bombers. Uh, big, you know, um, could fly quite high, and uh, they, they flew over. Um, their problem was that the, the wind flow comes to England from the southwest, and if you're starting from Germany to get to Britain, you had to fly into a headwind. And quite often these things would set out on a mission and they'd never get across the North Sea because they'd be flying into a headwind and making a net advance of about... They'd go home pretty quick, but coming forward, <laughs> they were pretty slow. Um, and they would come across day and night um, and bomb. Uh, it frightened the civilians who weren't used to being bombed, but it did no crucial uh, military damage. However, it did cause a degree of unrest amongst the politicians because they saw having their electorate bombed would mean the electorate would blame them for this and <laughs> they might not get elected, <laughs> as you can see. 
And this gave rise to the doctrine the bomber will always get through. Well, that's true. The bomber or a bomber will always get through. The problem is that it's when all the bombers get through you've got a problem, not when you can cut them down to a reasonable number. And even in the First World War, the amount of damage done in Loughborough, I think it may only kill a couple of people actually, but when you consider you've flown all the way from Germany to kill a couple of civilians, it's really hardly, hardly worth it. <laughs> so the truth is that the damage that was done just wasn't worth the effort of building the airplanes and flying them across the North Sea. The fallacy of the argument that you were fright frightening the women and children was completely fallacious. Um, because the, first of all, there were no wartime elections during the First World War. So frightening women and children was pointless. But anyway, neither of them had the vote. What was the <laughs> point of frightening women and children uh, to change the government and give up when um, neither of them had the vote? So the whole strategy was really fatally flawed. Um, the, the highlight raid, one which, there was one raid which was quite serious, it was on, Folk, on, on Folkestone, just across the channel, and it was a diversion target, the Germans couldn't get much further in the headwind and they bombed Folkestone, um, and they killed a hundred odd people and did quite a lot of damage in the town, and this is the, if you like, the first terror bombing raid uh, by aircraft uh, during, in, in history really, I suppose. So in Britain, um, between the wars, there was seen to be a need for something which would shoot down the bombers. And the key to this, I've called it an interceptor, it wasn't really a fighter, the bombers were a pretty slow moving, easy target, you didn't need manoeuvrability. What you needed was a very high rate of climb, these things are flying fairly high in the air, you've got to get up to them. This was their problem right back at the beginning, trying to shoot down zeppelins. So the fighter, which is this interceptor, is going to need to be light and fast because it's got to climb a long way very quickly. Now the first thing you're going to need for that is a powerful engine. And powerful engines at the time weren't actually uh, that powerful and there's all sorts of problems with um, trying to make powerful engines and put them in aeroplanes. <coughs> anyway, the, the basic idea gave rise to the Hurricane and the Spitfire specifications. This one's a Hurricane um, coming into land. Um, it's a uh, fabric construction, but basically it's got a big engine in the front with a propeller on the front of that. Everybody's aware you need a propeller to push you along, pull you along in this case. The pilot sits over the wing, there's a tailplane, the undercarriage is under the wing. The wing is in fact metal. This was the first monoplanes. They've got a lot less drag than biplanes, so they go a lot faster. And the pilot sits there, and between the pilot and the engine is the fuel tank. And the fuel tank's there because you burn, as you burn the fuel away, the centre of lift has to stay with the wings. You've got to keep the centre of gravity over the centre of lift, so the pilot sits on top, well, he sat behind the fuel tank in uh, both of these aircraft. And what are their characteristics? Because they all look pretty much the same. They've all got two wings, a tail, and an engine, and a pilot, and fuel. Basically, it's an aerodynamically clean fuselage. The, you don't want any bits sticking out. The whole idea of going to a monoplane was to get rid of all those bracing wires um, between the, the two wings on biplanes. It needs to be just big enough to accommodate a sitting single pilot. All right? If you carry two pilots, the thing's quite clearly not going to climb as fast as it would if you only have one. So it's going to be a clean fuselage single pilot and sitting down <clears throat> the size of the fuselage has to be big enough for a pilot to sit inside. <clears throat> it's going to be a stressed wing monoplane because this is the smoothest, slickest form of wing you can have. <coughs> it's going to have a powerful single engine and you are restricted because you want the, the, the basic size <coughs> of the fuselage is designed around the pilot. You need an engine which produces a lot of power uh, doesn't have very much frontal area. So you finish up with inline cylinders, one behind the other, and very difficult to cool that with air cooling. So it's going to have liquid cooling for the engine as well. 
And as I've said before, all the weight changes, that's the fuel, the ammunition that you fire off and everything else, all has to be above the wing because uh, that's uh, where the uh, center of lift is. Now, characteristic of airplane engines is that they all run at almost constant speed. This is propeller driven ones. And the power of an engine is going to vary as the mass of the air that goes through. You're, you're burning fuel. And for fuel you need, to, bu to burn the fuel you need air, and therefore the power of the engine is geared to how much air you can actually cram through uh, the engine. And it burns a fixed composition, um, petrol air mixture. And this graph, if you can you can't see my little spot, you can see it on the blue, but not on the white. This is a diagram of the pressure, atmospheric pressure this way, in millibars, goes from a thousand down to north, with altitude going across here. This is in meters, so this is 15,000 feet. So the amount of air you're going to cram through your engine when you're flying at 15,000 feet is about half what it was at sea level. And at 30,000 feet, it's down to a quarter. So your engine is going to produce half the power at 15,000 feet, quarter the power at 30,000 feet. Now that's a big, big problem because, you know, you're trying to climb, uh, you start losing power with altitude. <coughs> so to avoid this drop-off in power with altitude, the solution is to compress the air before you put it into the engine. So you use the engine to run a compressor. The compressor pushes more air into the engine, so you produce more power. Now, provided you get more power out than you've put into the compressor, you're on a winner. And this is known in motor car parlance as a supercharger. You stick a blower, if you like, on the front of the engine, and it pushes more air yeah, into the engine. It was first uh, developed for racing cars, but the um, uh, application uh, for uh, aircraft engines was uh, soon seen. Now, this is a bit complicated, but the, the key to it is only in a tiny little piece. Uh, this is the energy and the fuel you're putting in the engine. And this is the power that you're taking out of the engine. And most of the energy that you burn in the fuel goes straight out, this is true of your motor car as well, goes straight out down the exhaust pipe, which is why the exhaust pipe gets hot, and if you catch on with it, you'll burn your fingers. <laughs> the engine's water-cooled, so there's heat transfer from the inside where you're burning the fuel into the um, um, cylinder jacket, that's water-cooled, and you get thermal losses from that. Now this is the potential power you've got, and you're going to take some of it, which is this tiny little bit here, which is used to run the uh, supercharger, and that increases the amount of power you're going to uh, get out of the engine. So it's actually very small overall, but if you look at the brake horsepower here, um, it's 29.6 is how much the efficiency of the thing is. And this is 2.6, so about 10% of the power that you're generating with your engine is going into the uh, compressor. The other thing that people, oh, you're all old enough probably to remember high octane fuel, and people mutter about high octane fuel and how more efficient. Well, yes, engines which run at high compression ratio are in fact more efficient. And the problem is though that if you put too low an octane fuel in a high compression engine, um, it knocks or pinks and it makes a noise, a very characteristic noise. If the octane rating of the fuel is too low, this is true on motor cars and it's also true of piston engine aeroplane engines. And all the key developments for this took place in the late 1920s and in the 1930s. So high octane fuel for your aircraft engine is going to be a vital component. No point having the engine if you haven't got the fuel. No point having the fuel if you haven't got the engine. And you'll see that uh, this mix doesn't always come together quite right. <coughs> During the First World War, there were a lot of airplanes flying. 
And the Americans, when they eventually came in for the First World War, uh, they decided the one thing they could contribute to the war effort was petrol. They had lots of it. And when they tried it, it pinked like hell in the um, uh, Allied airplanes, the French and the British planes. Uh, nobody really quite understood why at the time, but it just meant <coughs> it wasn't sort of much use. The, the actually why this is, is the oil source turns out to be different. The <coughs> allied British and French fuel came from the Dutch East Indies, which is where Shell had its primary production. Uh, the US petrol came from Texas, and everybody knows that anything that comes from Texas is rubbish. <laughs> There's maybe a lot of it, but it's very poor quality. But it's not merely the geographic location. The two fuels were actually chemically different. The idea that petrol is petrol and it's got one universal composition just isn't true. It's a mix of hundreds and hundreds of different things depending on uh, all sorts of uh, parameters. Now, in the 1920s, this is after the, because it's Texas and theirs was the second rate fuel, the American company started investigating why the uh, fuel from Borneo was uh, better than the fuel from Texas. And they had to come up with a rating for knocking in engines. And they picked two standard substances, these are pure chemical compounds, <coughs> normal heptane, <laughs> and iso-octane, and the iso-octane was given a rating of 100 and the heptane was given a rating of zero. <coughs> and what you do to measure the quality of your fuel, you have a little engine, standard engine, which, is, which means the things engineering-wise is quite interesting because every, every engine has a different knock property, so they all have to agree on what standard engine they were going to use. And you run your fuel in it, and you adjust the compression ratio. These have an adjustable cylinder head, so you can adjust the compression ratio. And you wind it down until the engine starts to knock. And then you go away, and you make up mixtures of heptane and octane, and try all of these in your engine until you find one that just starts to knock at the same value compression ratio as the, as the one you have. Now, it's a real pain in the ass to make one of these <laughs> measurements. You've got to make up these ratio. So you don't just put the fuel in and it just gives you the octane rating, you have to make up the mixtures. And this is where the um, octane rating comes from. It's the fraction of iso-octane in a mixture um, which gives a, 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 an octane number which is the knock propensity is the same for the standard fuel as for the one that you're trying to uh, measure. So why are these two actually different? Well, the difference is that one's a straight chain hydrocarbon <coughs> at the top. All the carbon atoms join to one another in a long chain. Iso-octane is very highly branched. In fact, you can't get more branched um, than that. And that's the structural difference makes a difference, a huge difference to the octane rating of the fuel. Now we get on to the wonderful world of additives. Um, somebody noticed that brown petrol had a higher octane rating than sort of clear white petrol. They thought, oh, that's interesting. I wonder if it's because it's brown. So how can you make petrol go brown? And one way of doing it is to put some iodine in, which they did, and they tested it on their new octane rating machine. And true enough, it had a higher octane rating than the clear white stuff that they started off with. So you could add something to your petrol which would improve its uh, octane rating. And America being America, this guy Midgley um, tested 30,000 possible additives. <laughs> Can you imagine that? On one of these crappy little things. They have rows and rows of these little test engines making up additive mixtures. They tried everything that you could possibly find that would dissolve in, in petrol. <coughs> and they discovered that tetraethyl lead was the wonderful additive. I mean, it was such an obscure compound at the time that you know, it had to be made specially for them by chemists in the lab. But just a few cc's of it would raise the octane rating by sort of 20 octane points, which was well worth having. Uh, at one time, um, 
aeroplane pilots would carry around a can of tetraethyl lead. Most of you all know it's fairly toxic, actually, it dissolves in the body fats. You know. Carrying around a can of this, and when you filled it up, you measure out a little cylinder and you pour your tetraethyl lead in and shake your plane and mix it all up. <laughs> now, one of the problems is if you're trying to make high octane fuel, is there's only a minuscule amount of iso-octane in crude oil. So if you want a high octane rating, you've got to turn other components in the crude oil into iso-octane. And how are you going to do that? Well, the chemical industry of this sort of period is, is pretty straightforward. Um, basically what you did was hydro-cracking. You took your paraffinic hydrocarbons and hydrogen and you heated them under pressure at 100 atmospheres. You had the right catalyst and you got them pretty damn hot, hundreds of degrees centigrade. Now if you've got a leak, of course, you can see you've got a problem with a piece of equipment like this, with 100 bars full of petrol. Uh, um, so it's not, not as safe as you might think. Uh, we've got the right catalyst and if the, basically what happens is the straight chain hydrocarbon breaks up in all sorts of components and then it puts itself all back together again. And some of those, a tiny fraction of them, will be octanes and iso-octane in particular. So that's one way of doing it. The other way is to join two light components together. It's relatively easy to get light components out of crude oil because you just keep heating it up and breaking down the, the molecules in it. And uh, once you're down this far, you can distill these components so you get them pretty pure. And if you mix isobutylene and isobutane in concentrated sulfuric acid, this is a 20 degree centigrade low temperature reaction, it makes isooctane. So there's a chemical route, there's two chemical routes by uh, which you can do it. And these were adopted um, particularly in America because they had more cars in the America than the rest of the world and were using more fuel. And this high octane thing for your car was, was, was a great selling point. You know, you get more power out of your engine um, with high octane fuel. And America being America has two air forces. It had an army air force and a navy air force. They don't just, didn't just have an air force on its own. And they competed like crazy between themselves. Very interesting story. Um, but they adopted 100 octane fuel for combat missions in uh, 19... They weren't fighting anybody, but they, they, this was the plan for combat missions because it does produce a vast amount more power out of your engine. And just to give you some idea of costs involved in this, ISO octane cost $2 a gallon in 1934. There was a massive... Because this was for the, 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 the car industry, there was a massive investment by the chemical industry and they brought the price down 50 cents a gallon in 1935, 18 cents a gallon in 1937, and then 15 cents a gallon for the rest of the war. America was a source of dirt cheap, high octane uh, petrol um, during the Second World War. And here's one of these little quirks of fate. Um, Britain bought, they were well aware of the need for high octane fuel. They brought a tanker load, which is 72,000 barrels, and a barrel is 40-odd gallons. It was shipped to Britain in a ship called the Beacon Hill, which has had a very interesting war history. It did survive the war as a tanker, which was quite an achievement, a lot of tankers were sunk. In June 1939, this is before the beginning of the war, it's Beacon Hill, and we've got a Beacon Hill, but it's not named after the same one, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and 72,000 barrels is quite a lot, and we were making high octane fuel, and this was enough that the RAF could consider moving to higher octane, 100 octane fuel for its uh, aircraft. And Fighter Command converted to a sort of British blend of 100 octane fuel in March 1940, which is only a few months after this tanker load arrived. The tanker load was, was quite important, because there was more tanker loads followed, but this was enough. And it, was, it came into Liverpool and was distributed around a load of uh, refineries and other places. But it's a British blend um, where we use the American um, high octane tanker load to uh, raise the octane of the stuff we were making. And to give you some idea of the uh, power difference, uh, the Merlin engine, which is going to be the classic engine that we're going to be dealing with, its maximum power rating went from about 1,000 horsepower to 1,300. 
you know, 30% increase in power. And you got this by upping the boost pressure on the supercharger. Um, it was raised, so you were compressing the fuel-air mixture before you put it in the into the engine, and it didn't pink even after you compressed it. And it was quite important because it enabled Spitfires to outfly in terms of just flat speed BF 109s. Now that you might know those who use Messerschmitt 109s, but uh, strictly speaking, it's a Bavarian uh, aircraft. And this is the Bavarian uh, BF uh, factory, um, and this was a lifesaver for a lot of the pilots because what they did was you. You sort of remove the boost knob down through the gate to maximum boost pressure if you had an ME109 after you and you could you could actually fly away from it. So that's actually quite a fine advantage. If you're not a very good pilot, you can fly faster than the other bloke, you can get away. And in the Battle of Britain, about 80% of the high octane fuel all came from America. So it has been argued that America won the Battle of Britain. So um, <laughs> somewhat sort of uh, loose. Uh, uh, this is a Rolls-Royce Merlin 1, which was the aircraft uh, power plant at the time. Uh, it's got two rows of six cylinders in a V, a V formation, and all this lot at the end, there's a blower at the end, the carburetors at the bottom, and uh, takes it up and uh, puts it into the um, engine. Uh, and you can vary the, um, how much you compress it in the turbo compressor. You can't see the details of this, but uh, just as well. The history of the Merlin is also a fascinating one. Uh, it demonstrates the incompetence of Rolls-Royce as actual fundamental aircraft designers. They were very good at development, but uh, they screwed up in all sorts of big ways. Uh, this is uh, a later version of the Merlin. <coughs> this is the famous... Merlin that uh, was made in America, and it's got a two two stage compressor on this far end. It's got one here and one here. <coughs> they they look a bit like um, vacuum cleaner fans. Is the anybody's taken a vacuum cleaner apart? <laughs> so here's our early Spitfire Merlin engine, fuel tank, pilot above the wing. Machine guns in the wings firing outside the uh, propeller. Uh, wings, quite a complicated thing, <coughs> we might come to. Again, it was designed as an interceptor, like the uh, Hurricane. It had an exceptionally thin wing, which was what made it uh, such a fast aircraft. And there's another little characteristic here, which all these things all happen to come together. Mm -hmm. You saw how much energy we had to get rid of, the energy that's gone into the uh, block of the engine. You've got to get rid of that. And you have a radiator which does that, like your car. And if you just stick the radiator out into the airflow and let the air blow through it, it slows you down. And the plan was to use evaporative cooling of the engine using steam condensers in the leading edge of the wing. This is for a Spitfire, right? Uh, they got this from the Schneider Trophy aircraft, um, which they had this very problem of how to cool the thing, and they were using the fuselage and the wings and evaporative cooling to actually cool the engine. Because if you can make the skin of a wing, you're not actually sticking a radiator out into the uh, airflow. The breakthrough was 1935 by an Englishman, Meredith, worked at the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough. And he showed, theoretically, um, that if you have a ducted radiator, the air which comes into the front of the duct, if you get the duct the right shape, you've got ram air coming in the front. You slow down the air as it goes into the duct and the air gets compressed as well. So it's actually going quite slowly when you put it through the radiator matrix. So you don't get so much drag. And then when it comes out the other end and it's hot, you can accelerate it back up to speed. And he showed that if you did this, you would significantly cut the drag of the radiators. Therefore, you didn't need to have pipes all through the wing to try and keep the damn thing cool. 
And if you went further and thought about this, when you got to go at very high speed, if you had the proper design, you've got extra thrust out of this radiator because the airflow coming in was heated up and then ejected out of the back. You could get the sort of jet type thrust um, out of it. And this was such a brilliant uh, technical development that every, every aircraft manufacturer immediately went to uh, glycol water liquid cooling rather than this complicated steam condensation system that was adopted for all of the aircraft flying you know, in the Battle of Britain. And here's one of these ducted <laughs> radiators under the wing of a Spitfire. This is the intake. It's a curious shape. And you can see at the back here it's got a an adjustable exhaust. So you can change the amount of air that's going through this by changing how much is being let out the back. Now the other characteristic of the Spitfire and the Hurricane was they both had propellers on the front. And there's a problem with a propeller. If you want to go very fast, you need a coarse bridge propeller. And if you want to have a lot of power when you're taxiing and going slowly and taking off, you need a fine bridge propeller. And usually you had a compromise in between. And the technical development here was the development of a, a variable pitch propeller where the blades could be rotated while you were flying along. Uh, quite a complicated mm. thing to do because um, there's a lot of forces on these things. You know, there's, there's a thousand horsepower going through this thing and you're trying to rotate the, the, the various parts of it. Um, is, is actually quite difficult. And the Germans had their own and we had them and they were all developed. And the beauty of it was you could have fine pitch for takeoff mm. and then coarse pitch when you were in high speed flight. Um, I don't know if any of you know much about the Schneider Trophy which was held down in, in Southampton. They were all seaplanes. And the reason they were all seaplanes and didn't have folding undercarriage and, and so on was they, had fixed, they only had fixed pitch propellers in those days, and it was a speed race, you needed a coarse pitch propeller, and it was very inefficient when you came to take off. So the length of runway that you would need to take off with wheels was longer than any existing runway. So they made them seaplanes so they could have a very inefficient takeoff and uh, run down uh, Southampton water. The blades were still made of wood, and here's a rather guilty looking pilot who's nearly managed to nose his plane down a bit on landing and managed to chopple off the ends of all of the um, propellers, or uh, ends of all, each of the blades. But having uh, constant speed propellers with wooden blades is fine. They, 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 they were composite wood, they were glued together and things. Uh, but later on, metal, <coughs> metal blades came in. The German planes had metal. Blades. Now, <clears throat> you might have got the impression that this is all pretty high-tech stuff, which it is, which makes the aircraft very, very expensive. It means you can't have too many of them, and you want to cut down on all of this. So, if you all this is for is to intercept the bomber, you understand. So, they need to be directed to the interception. So, you need to know where the enemy is, and you need to know where your guys are, so you can actually get them to come together. The sky is a very big place. It's, you know, it's up and down and left and right. And the planes are actually quite small, so you, know, you can't see them when they're 20 miles away. So, you need an observer corps, or later it was called the Royal Observer Corps, and this was thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people who sat in little posts. You identified the planes coming in with a pair of binoculars, the other bloke measures the uh, altitude on a field of light. And I'm not sure what the bloke at the back does, I suspect he makes the tea or something. <laughs> <laughs> now, these, by this time, aircraft are moving about 200 miles an hour. With fast aircraft like this, you need some sort of early warning. Because to get your plane up there, this is this interceptor, this is this very elegant, fast interceptor. It takes about 15 minutes to get off the ground and get up to 15,000 feet. A bomber flying at 200 miles an hour will fly 50 miles by the time you've got off the ground and got, just got up to the altitude that he's flying at. So you've got to have some way of tracking this. And if you're relying on the observer corps, uh, they don't see the plane until it crosses the coast. 
uh, it's got 50 mile radius before you can scramble your aircraft and get them up to uh, attack them. So you need something which can see out beyond the coast. And that leads us to radar, which everybody knows was the key to the Battle of Britain. I, I hope you all know that, did you? Yeah. yeah. yeah good, right. Now, all these um, new aircraft, they were all aluminium and they scattered radio waves. It was known quite early on that metal aircraft would distort wireless transmissions on the radio. They would get distorted. And by a quirk of fate, Britain had a team investigating scattering of uh, radio waves by the ionosphere and also tracking thunderstorms um, <coughs> as well. And they were dragged in to this. It wasn't a radar project at the time. They were just asked what might possibly be done to give us early warning of uh, aircraft coming in. And being civilians, they had no real concept of what the military wanted or anything. They just went ahead and did what looked reasonable at the time to them. They, these, these were world-class experts, top men in the field. There was no point in having a general telling them what to do. They were pretty well given a completely uh, free hand. And they started in 1935. And they made absolutely staggering, you know, they didn't be bothered to report a lot of the improvements that they were making because they were making an even bigger one tomorrow, you know. It was <coughs> quite extraordinary. And they had a advanced warning radar system working by May 1937. Uh, it was a heap of junk, but it did work. And then in a very brave move, um, somebody ordered uh, 21 of these stations to be built around the coast of uh, Britain. Uh, it's called Chain Home. Uh, it was completed Easter 1939, just before the uh, Second World War. And a lot of this stuff was, uh, it was ordered to um, be, be built, uh, I, I won't say it was off the drawing board, it was, it was ordered. Um, but it was sort of a pro it was a prototype, and there were lots and lots of options that could be made later. The mm. first thing was to get the thing up and looking, because it could tell you whether there was an aircraft out there somewhere, 50 miles away. Right? It was better to know there was an aircraft out there 50 miles away than to know exactly what bearing it was on and heading and all the rest of it. <laughs> Just knowing it was there was a fairly rare event. Uh, just knowing it was there was worth having. This was a, it, basically, this is a huge floodlight arrangement. We'll come to it how it works in a minute. Also, you need a control system to go with it. There's no point just having one of these. <clears throat> you need lots, and you need to collect all the information. It was crude, uh, but the, the most important thing to realize here, it was better to have something that was crap than nothing at all. <laughs> now, this is not something you're used to thinking of these days. Um, you know, everybody wants things that work perfectly and so on. Mm. These things were hopelessly imperfect, but they were better than nothing, right? When you're comparing something to nothing, right, they were also extortionately expensive. And they were, they were much helped by Watson Watt. His great contribution was that everything in these new radar stations was to be third best. Because experience had told him that first best never happens. <laughs> There's too many problems, costs, everything's too slow. Second best is still never available on time. Basically, you've got to cobble together what you can with what you've got and make it work now, straight away. And in, in many ways, this was the key to getting this to go. His realization that going for the gold plated, you know, these days people want aircraft that do every goddamn thing on, them, on the planet in one plane. And the net result is they cost so much money and they take so long to develop that you never see them. <laughs> so mostly it used components that were already available at the time. They didn't use sophisticated components. It was stuff that would, there was television was just coming into its uh, infancy. So you could lift stuff out of the television industry as well. But most of it was just stuff that was made by the electronics industry. However, these things were very clever in spite of being fairly crude. And there's never been another system that worked like this um, because everybody would fall off their chair laughing if you suggested building a radar system that worked like this. <laughs> First of all, it worked on a frequency of 12 meters. Now, there's no radar in the world, I don't think, that works on 12 meters. 
But the reason was <coughs> that they could generate big pulses of radio waves, 200 kilowatt pulses, at this frequency with valves they had already. They weren't going to develop something which would work better. This is what you had already in 1935. You could do it straight away. And rather than, this, this is so big that you need a thing the size of John Bank to focus it into a beam. So what you did was you just sent this pulse out into the sky. Right. It was a floodlight technique. It lit up everything. It, didn't focus, it, it did primitively focus, but very, 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 very simple. And then you, you, got, you got an echo back. They had a receiver. You got an echo back. So you could, if you had, you had, there was one aircraft out there. You, you switched this thing on. It would pick up the one aircraft. Uh, ideally, you'd like to know where that aircraft was. And then this was a bolt-on extra, which was a simple uh, goniometer, uh, which we'll come to in a minute. And this is what a typical chain home radar station looks like. Mm -hmm. The tall towers are 450 feet high, and the little the short ones are 350. The, the three tall towers have a curtain of wire between them, and is the <coughs> transmitter. The receiver is separate, and it's... Uh, the, the, the four towers are north, south, east, and west. And they're the receiving towers are made of wood. This is a painting of one. Um, the wires between the tall towers, not only did it work on a long cable, <coughs> it also worked on a stupendously slow pulse repetition rate of 25 pulses a second. <laughs> now, radars these days work much, much higher frequency than that. The reason was it had to be locked to the main frequency because the transmissions that this thing was making uh, interfered with the national grid. <laughs> and you could get the radar station and the national grid to ring together. And you couldn't interpret anything out of this. And this was called running rabbits at the time as if these sort of signals got chased around everywhere. Um, so if you locked it to the main frequency, then at least you didn't have that problem. And there's the short towers, north, south, east, and west. Here's your floodlight transmitter tower. The platforms are able you to work on the aerial. And the tower, you only strictly need two. The three towers are because there's a duplicate um, frequency on which it would work. All of these were built to operate on two frequencies, an anti-jamming technique, it was really quite extraordinarily sophisticated for its period. So the line of shoot, as it were, was this really great floodlight beam that this curtain area uh, sent out. The receiver used a, a, a goniometer for uh, direction finding. The four towers had aerials on them. And you connected the aerials up so the north-south went to one coil, east-west went to another, and the coils are at 90 degrees to, to, to one another. All right? And you have a search coil that fits in the middle, and as you wind the search coil around, the, the voltage in the search coil goes up and down. There's a minimum and a maximum <coughs> position from which you can work out what direction your echo is uh, coming back in. Now, this was a bolt-on extra. Originally, they thought by having all of these radio stations, transmitters, you could triangulate to get where an aircraft was. You've got two, you've got two radar stations, you can try, you know the distance is away, you can triangulate. And it turned out that didn't work at all. Um, because if you had more than one aircraft being observed by these, if you had one aircraft, it was fine. Immediately you had groups of aircraft, um, you couldn't decide which was which to do the um, calculation. It still couldn't do height, but again, a uh, bolt-on luxury extra was they did the same thing on our 200-foot-high wooden lattice towers. You have two receiving aerials, and they're at different heights, and they, they, they go to two sets of coils, and you wind your goniometer around, and you can get a minimum and maximum position. So here's the, what you see on the screen. This is what you transmit. The target is this little blip here. And by turning your goniometer on the, the, the one that sweeps um, sort of north, south, east, and west, this little blip will go away unless you've got the goniometer in exactly the right position. So you get it in that position. 
Then you tweak the up and down one until you get this to be the maximum size. That's now searching up and down. And you can get the, the height, the way it was worked out, you got the height from the distance between a line on the screen there, and you got the range from the uh, distance uh, there. And you read the direction uh, of the uh, goniometer. This is all very complicated. The only really complicated bit of kit they had to make was the uh, goniometer with its search coil in the middle of these other coils. Uh, at right angles, they were quite precise and they didn't have to be developed, particularly for this project. The people who operated the sets were almost exclusively women, and it turned out that because this was such a, it was almost like a living being trying to operate one of these things, it was extraordinarily complicated, and there were peripheral bits of information which came in off the screen that you could interpret, and it, it, it turned out that the WAFs that operated these were quite extraordinarily skillful after a while, and they could tell you whether how many aircraft there were in the blip and, and so on, and they could see blips which weren't there because they were picking out of the noise of the, of the baseline. So you've got to collect all this information, and there you have uh, the WAFs plotting it, and there's information coming in, and uh, above them, uh, behind that sort of curved glass, there's people looking down on the plot. So you're keeping track, all these radar stations are keeping track of what's actually happening, the battle's under central control. Uh, this was a, a practice group when it was all men, of course, and they, when they actually came to the operations, it was all, 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 all completely women. And then they could then give instructions to the various fighter stations as to when to send their aircraft up to go and where to go to find the Germans. And this is the classic Battle of Britain photograph of pilots running out to uh, their aeroplanes to scramble to uh, get up to intercept the aircraft that are coming in. Now that's wonderful about the enemy because you knew where they were. You need to know where your team were as well. And this was done by, again, an astonishingly primitive system it was called Pip Squeak, because there was Pip Squeak and Wilfried, for those of you who are aware What happens is that there's a, all of these aircraft have radio on them to communicate with base, and for 15 seconds in every minute, it transmitted a direction finding signal, and these aircraft operated in a particular area. They had um, three detecting stations, one, two, and three which could locate where they were. Um, so every 15 seconds, every, every, about every minute, you knew where the aircraft was, but it interrupted the, uh, it was using, if, if you like, piggybacked on top of the, bit like your telephone, somebody switches your telephone off for 15 seconds, you know, every minute. So, but you could override it, the pilots could override it if they, if they needed to. There was also a thing called identification friend or foe, which was used at the end, and what happened was your aircraft carried a, re a responder which, when it was illuminated by a chain home radar station, it transmitted a powerful pulse back. So the operator, when they saw this on the screen, you got two blips. You got one from the um, aircraft and then you got another one which was a bigger one, which was the uh, IFF sending it back but it was hardly used uh, during the Battle of Britain. And this is an IFF installation. The problem is they're, they're, they're heavy, they weigh 40 pounds. You can tell whether they're fitted by whether the aerial's there on the outside of the plane. Oh, time to look at the Germans. The Germans are a funny lot. <laughs> Their philosophy is completely different to ours. Mostly because Germany was in the middle of Europe and it mostly has land borders with everybody, whereas we have the sea around the outside. They hadn't been bombed in the First World War. And they were uh, aggressive. They, they weren't looking to defend their country, they were looking to attack everybody else. So they needed an air force which would support its armies, who were again attacking everybody else. <clears throat> so uh, it gave rise to various decisions. First of all, they didn't have any long-range heavy bombers because there was no real need, because the Air Force, the Army, they just needed to be 100 miles ahead of the Army, and, and that wasn't a problem. They had a brilliant radar system, absolutely totally different to ours, very modern uh, in many ways, 
and very precise, but it could only direct one fighter onto one bomber. Which is great if there's one bomber. <coughs> uh, immediately there's 100 of them. Uh, had a bit of a problem. Whereas the chain home thing could deal with uh, several attacks of 100 bombers and fighters coming in at once. So that, that was it. But, but it was fine because they weren't going to fight it. They had the biggest air force uh, in the world. Um, they just didn't see any need to worry too much about it. They also had precision blind bombing techniques, which we didn't. That's because they were planning to be aggressive and go and bomb everybody else. Uh, but because they hadn't actually thought this through, they hadn't actually prepared a proper air defense. And therefore, they didn't really know how to attack anybody else either in you know, any serious um, uh, air defense. Their key aircraft was the ME or BF-109. Very similar performance and range to a Spitfire, but very, very much cheaper to build. And they made these all through the war. You can see this one that's got variable pitch propeller on the front, but it's got metal blades. Because they've bent, they haven't broken off like our RAF equivalent. It was a very sophisticated aeroplane, actually. And cheap to bake. <clears throat> so their basic strategy was to have overwhelming strength and make it up as you go along. They didn't give too much advanced thought, like we did, to the bomber we always get through. The second advantage they had was they had a very large number of very experienced pilots. And they started the Battle of Britain with five times the strength of the RAF. And it started with attacks. This is now just a little account of how this turned out. It started with attacks by the Germans um, on shipping in the English Channel because that's uh, as close to France as you could get. And it turned out, they discovered then, that the Spitfire was a formidable aircraft against the uh, 109. Now, what Britain hadn't thought about when it had come up with its air defence plan was they hadn't allowed for the fact that the Germans were going to be in Calais. Because the Germans had captured France by now, so they actually had advanced air bases incredibly close to, to um, Britain. And in fact, they were within the range of Chain Home. That big red line that goes around, the outer red line, is the range of the Chain Home stations. We could sit there and watch the Germans taking off in Calais, waiting to attack across the channel. But if they used bombers to attack ships, the Spitfires and Hurricanes cut them to pieces. But, again, the Germans were a little bit better than we were. They managed to recover nearly all of their air crew that were shot down. Uh, the RAF was pathetic in its uh, provision for this. Um, usually, any aircraft shot down in the channel, the pilot drowned because there was no air sea rescue at the time. So, what happened was it proved to be a bit pointless fighting the Germans over the channel, so we retreated back over the, over the land. And that meant the Germans had to come further across, and they started attacking the air stations from which the fighters were coming up. And they, they did that very successfully, shot up all sorts of places. And they attacked Chain Home as well. But when they were attacking the bases, Chain Home meant we had advanced warning, and the German bomber losses were much, much higher than they anticipated. They couldn't understand where all these ruddy fighters were coming from because they were being directed to them. You know, um, if they were just relying on finding them by chance. Anyway, Chain Home was also attacked. But Germany didn't really realize the importance of it. And what's more, Chain Home often the transmissions kept going, even though the station was knocked out. They could keep a transmitter going, so the Germans still thought it was working. So any of the receiving side was damaged. They kept the transmitter going. So um, the Germans eventually gave up. They, they seemed to be getting nowhere. They're very difficult things to bomb, because you can fly into the towers and so on if you're precision bombing. And then we come to the biggest blunder of all. The Germans started bombing London. Now, it wasn't very good for London, but from the Battle of Britain point of view, it was a catastrophic blunder. It meant that the fighter stations were no longer degraded, so we could fly more missions. 
and it was also just about as far as the BF 109s could go to get there and back. They had 10 minutes over London, mm -hmm. assuming they flew at the most economical mm -hmm. speed from Calais across. Now it had a short range, and therefore they couldn't defend the um, bombers very successfully. The sort of most important factor of this, though, was that all the German air crew that were shot down were lost, as far as the Germans were concerned. They may have survived, but they were prisoners. This is crucially important uh, in the Battle of Britain. And by attacking London, <coughs> uh, we made a big mistake. And what happened was eventually the German losses uh, got too great. They were proportionally about equal. Um, you know, if we lost one pilot, they lost five, because their air force was five times as big. So proportionally, they were suffering the same damage, if you like, as fighting command. Fighting command was struggling like crazy. So the Germans then shifted from daylight bombing to the Blitz. And I was born during the Blitz. Um, and the Blitz ended finally when uh, the Germans decided that they wouldn't want to fight us at all. They'd go and attack the Russians instead. And they shifted all their aircraft across. Now, this is where the importance of the Battle of Britain really comes to the fore, because the aircraft and crew that they'd lost in the Battle of Britain, that the Luftwaffe had lost, were a key factor in their failure to capture Moscow. Most of you will know that the Germans got to the gates of Moscow. Had they had all of the aircraft and air crew that were shot down during the Battle of Britain, they would have had even more air superiority than they had already, and they would almost certainly have made it through and captured Moscow. So this was a definitive battle in the Second World War. So let's just look at the losses for a moment. Aircraft first. We lost 1,000, Germans lost 2,000. However, our aircraft industry had got geared up got its sort of acting gear, and they managed to produce 2,300 aircraft, even though they lost 1,000. So actually, at the end of the Battle of Britain, we had more aircraft than we had at the beginning. Germans, on the other hand, lost nearly 2,000, and only replaced 1,000 of them. Now, you can imagine what those 2,000 aircraft would have done if you were attacking Russia. <coughs> Crew, uh, these are the actual, these aren't, aren't deaths, these are the people you've lost. Now, for, for the Allies of Britain, it means they're, they're, they're essentially dead, but for the Germans, it involves the captured ones as well. And you can see it's about five to one. And to give you some idea of the perspective of this, in the Blitz, 41,000 civilians mostly were killed, 139,000 were injured. The actual manpower losses in the Battle of Britain both on both sides are negligible compared with the civilian casualties. The problem is that killing civilians is a waste of time. You're using very sophisticated aeroplanes and trained men and you're killing people basically who are not going to contribute to the war at all. And that's the, the last slide which is the, the, the casualties and all this. I thought I'd better mention that there were people lost in this. But most of the talk has been about the science and technology behind the Battle of Britain, showing just how complicated it actually was. So that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. We all thought we knew about the Battle of Britain, didn't we? <laughs> Uh, but Jeff has produced all the facts and the figures and the details that we didn't know about. And uh, there were lots of interesting things there, if you're an engineer at all, that you uh, were unaware of, or only knew in passing. So thank you very much, Jeff, for an excellent talk. Some of you don't know that Jeff hasn't been very well since Christmas, and uh, it was a bit touch and go whether he could make it today, so I want to give him a special thanks for making the effort to come today and to present this talk to us. So if you